to Psalm 45, verses 1 to 5, as our text this morning. Psalm 45. We'll read verses 1 through 5. For the choir director, according to the Shoshanim, a maskil of the sons of Kor, a song of love. My heart overflows with a good theme. I address my verses to the king. My tongue is the pen of a ready writer. You're fairer than the sons of men. Grace is poured upon your lips. Therefore, God has blessed you forever. Gird your sword on your thigh, O mighty one, in your splendor and your majesty. And in majesty, ride on victoriously for the cause of truth and meekness and righteousness. Let your right hand teach you awesome things. Your arrows are sharp. The peoples fall under you. Your arrows are in the heart of the king's enemies. Grass withers flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Amen. Amen. Be seated, please, as we turn to our hymn of preparation for the preaching of the word, number 303 in the Trinity Hymnal. 
Amen. Lord, we come to your word, living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit of both joint and marrow, able to judge the thoughts and intentions of our hearts. We pray, O Father, that you would indeed lay our hearts bare and open before you by your powerful word, and that you would send your powerful spirit to bless the preaching and the hearing of it, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Children, have you ever noticed when you attend a wedding that the bride is the center of attention, especially at the outset of the wedding? When the, the bride's march begins to play, she begins to make her way down the aisle, smiles light up the faces of the guests at the wedding, and the groom's eyes light up when he sees his bride coming down the aisle in her beautiful wedding dress. Well, in Psalm 45, the psalmist is writing about a wedding. But unlike modern weddings, it's the bridegroom and not the bride. That's the center of attention in this wedding because the bridegroom is one of the kings of Israel. We don't know which one. Some have speculated that this describes Solomon's wedding. We don't know whose wedding this was, but it was one of the kings of Israel. And the bridegroom is the center. And what we learn, children, is that this psalm isn't merely about a great king of Israel. It's about the greatest of kings, King Jesus. The poet of this psalm is excited. He can hardly contain himself. It's bubbling over out of him as he thinks about this great theme. He pays tribute to the bridegroom king. He rehearses the various aspects of the king's reign which compels him to extol the excellencies of this king. But it's clear that the one whose excellencies he extols is much greater than an earthly king, even of the Davidic line. Because you notice that several things are said about this particular king. He is eternally blessed, verse 2. He sits upon an eternal throne. He's called God. He's called Elohim. He's called uh, that by that name rendered in our English translations, God, twice in verses 6 and 7. The two chief characters of the psalmist's description are Christ and the bridegroom, his church, the bride, uh, the, the, the bride rather, the bride of Christ. Psalm 45 takes its place among the messianic psalms, so called because they're quoted in the New Testament in direct reference to the Lord Jesus Christ. The Psalms speak more directly than any other book in the Old Testament to Christ. They portray Christ fully as the divine Messiah. In the Psalter, Jesus Christ is the central figure. And we have a complete picture of his life and ministry, his incarnation, his death, his sufferings, his resurrection, his ascension, his exaltation to glory, and the glory of his kingdom. In Psalm 45, 1 through 8, the Holy Spirit has given us a portrayal of Christ 
in his mediatorial offices of prophet, priest, and king. But they don't fall into the neat lines and packages of our systematic theology. Rather, the descriptions that the psalmist gives to us of the Messiah is as a kingly prophet and a priestly king. Those two things will take up our time today in the preaching of God's word. This morning, Christ as our kingly prophet, and this evening, Christ as our priestly king. And I can think of no greater subject upon which to dwell. And I hope that's true of you as well, that there is no greater theme for our worship today or any day than Christ Jesus, our kingly prophet and our priestly king. This morning we want to see from our text in verses 1 to 5 that the psalmist prophetically portrays Christ as our kingly prophet. Christ, our kingly prophet, in the first place, is the greatest among the prophets, and secondly, he's the supreme, triumphant king. Christ, our kingly prophet, is the greatest among the prophets, and he's the supreme, triumphant king. You notice the psalmist is speaking about one who, whose speech is excellent. Uh, One whose speech excels. He's speaking of a a prophet. First, he says that this one's excellencies far far excel all men. He's the most excellent of men, verse 2. He's fairer than all other men. Jesus is indeed the the chief among ten thousands. The one who's altogether lovely. But in particular, he's one whose speech far exceeds any of the prophets. And that's remarkable since the psalmist is undoubtedly familiar with both the former and the latter prophets who had uttered divinely inspired and and wondrous sayings themselves. Solomon and his father David, you remember, filled a prophetic role as well. They spoke as prophets But the one of whom the poet here prophetically speaks is not just one among the prophets. He's not talking about a king of Israel in his prophetic role. He's speaking about the one through whom God spoke through Moses, one who would be greater than Moses. Deuteronomy 18, 18, I will raise up a a prophet from among their countrymen like you, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And God says of that prophet through Moses, it shall come about that whoever will not listen to my words, which he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. So this is a prophet par excellence, the greatest of prophets, the greatest of speakers. Other men have spoken gracious words. The history of mankind is replete with great orders. We could make mention of the ancient Roman philosopher and statesman Cicero or of the Roman dictator Julius Caesar. Or shall we speak of preachers? John Chrysostom, great preacher of the early 4th and 5th centuries who was nicknamed Golden Tongue for his great orations in his sermons. Or Charles Haddon Spurgeon, known as the Prince of Preachers, who 
whose preaching in London captivated congregations of thousands, or George Whitfield, whose powerful pulpit oratory was described by one of his biographers as an uncommon influence right here in Newburgh, North Carolina at the First Presbyterian Church. But Christ, the kingly prophet, is by far more eminently gracious in speech than any other prophet or any other orator the world has ever known, now knows, or shall know. There's a preposition here in, in the original text that has a wide range of, of meanings. Grace is poured upon his lips. Grace is poured through his lips, from his lips. It's used as a preposition of means. Christ's lips were the instruments by which the grace of the Godhead was poured out upon human beings. Regarding the the prophets, Spurgeon commented in, in a sermon on Psalm 45, it might be said that their doctrine dropped as the rain, their speech distilled like the dew. Such imagery, however, is too faint to describe the gracious speaker of our text. Not merely did he speak at, as the dew, nor did his message simply drop as, as, as the small rain. It poured out of his lips. Remember the testimony of the synagogue worshipers at Nazareth that Luke records in chapter 4 of his gospel after Jesus had read and explained the, the prophet Isaiah and all, who were, all were speaking well of him and wondering at the gracious words that were falling from his lips. And so John, when comparing the prophetic roles of Moses and Jesus, in, his, in the first chapter of his gospel, writes of the fulfillment of grace in Christ, the incarnate word. The word became flesh. It's something we're thinking about this particular season. We should be thinking about it at every season, but at this season in particular, we're thinking about Christ and his incarnation, the birth of Jesus. And John writes that when the Word became flesh, when the Word was incarnate, when He dwelt among us, we beheld His glory, glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. Now, John's not pitting Jesus against Moses and the law. Because he says here, literally, grace in place of grace. He's speaking about the grace of the law in comparison to the grace of the gospel, the fullness of the gospel, the fulfillment of all things in Jesus Christ. So the law through Moses is God's gracious provision for sinners. It enables them to see their sin and to flee to the fulfillment of that law in Jesus Christ. The word made flesh is the embodiment of that grace. And this prophet of whom the psalmist speaks came into the world as a baby, a king in the cradle to make known the will of God for our salvation. And he spoke gracious words. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Upon you. Learn from me, for I'm gentle 
humble in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. And the writer to the Hebrews says, Therefore God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days he has spoken to us in his Son. And note how in chapter 1 and verse 3 of the letter to the Hebrews, the writer expresses something very similar to the psalmist's sentiments here in Psalm 45. And he is the radiance of his glory. And the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power. The greatest of prophets is indeed fairer than the sons of men. For from this prophet, the glory of God radiates in his life and in his speech. And by his powerful word, the All that's been created, everything that we know of the creation, was created. And the world is sustained by the same word of power. This is the prophet of whom the psalmist speaks. And therefore, verse 2 serves to indicate not that he's blessed because of his beauty and gracious speech merely, but that these qualities are proofs that God the Father's eternal blessing have been laid upon this eternal prophet, Jesus Christ. Christ, our kingly prophet, is the greatest among the prophets. The second thing that our text teaches us, and this overlaps somewhat with what we'll be dealing with tonight, but in a different way. Verses 3 and 4, we're shown that Christ, our kingly prophet, is the supreme and triumphant king. You notice the prophet is speaking in terms of faith. He's prophesying in terms of faith, and he's In those terms, he's calling out to this triumphant king. He calls upon the kingly prophet to equip himself for his glorious triumph and to ascend to his majestic course. He's most mighty. Who can stand against the king of kings, Jesus Christ? His weapons secure a victorious result. And I want you to notice that they won't be wielded for bloodshed, but to overcome the hearts and the minds of men and women and boys and girls. Notice their unique combination in verse 4. And in your majesty, ride on victoriously for the cause of truth, meekness, and righteousness. Now, in particular, what does meekness have to do with victory? What does meekness have to do with power, the power of a triumphant king? He, by his truth, lays error in the dust of shame. His meekness sweetly draws sinners to himself. His righteousness covers all of the guilt and the corruption of his glorious bride for all who come under his triumphant influence. And most appropriately, you notice that the psalmist calls the messianic king to gird on his sword, which is what the fulfillment of this messianic prophecy in the New Testament, it's the word of truth. It's the sword of the Spirit that the psalmist prophetically calls upon the Messiah to wield. These words are prophetic of the role that the incarnate Christ would take in bringing the truth of the Father to bear upon the souls of men. 
And so our prophet Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And so our prophet Jesus said, when I send my spirit, the spirit of truth, he will guide you into all the truth, for he shall take of mine and shall disclose it to you. He rides forth victoriously for the cause of truth. Since he champions the godly causes of truth and meekness and righteousness, the writer is sure of his victory. He brings down the enemies with the arrows of his truth. Right hand in our text expresses the kingly prophet's power to protect his people by the word of truth and secure his subjects to that word. Let your right hand teach you awesome things implies that the prophet, uh, the prophetic king's capabilities are, are even beyond what the, the psalmist could conceive of, or humanly speaking. His arrows of conviction are sharp when directed by the Spirit. The contrite sinner feels the grievous wounds that the sword of the Spirit makes and humbly mourns his miserable condition. The one who inflicts the wound is alone the one who can cure the wound. His blood alone can heal the pain. Have his arrows reached you? Can you say in your experience that these arrows have inflicted in you a wound that is incurable apart from the work of this kingly prophet who rides forth triumphantly in truth. Christ, our catechism says, exercises the office of a prophet by subduing us to himself by the word of truth. Has Christ subdued you to himself by his word? He he brings the word of truth to bear upon our souls. And had he not done so, those of you who can proclaim this kingly prophet's influence would still be dead in your sins, still suffering the consequences, still under the wrath and curse of God. It was the spirit of this kingly prophet who was actively at work in you, enlightening your mind in the knowledge of Christ. And he continues to subdue you, to reveal to you by his word and spirit the will of God for your salvation. The psalmist portrays Christ, our kingly prophet, as the greatest among the prophets whose weapons are those of truth and meekness and righteousness. Christ is the kingly prophet who is fairer than the sons of men, greater by far than all of the prophets, and eminently gracious in speech, having subdued you to himself and having revealed to you by his word and spirit the will of God for your salvation. He rules over you, he defends you, and he conquers all of his and your enemies, even the greatest of enemies the father of lies, the devil himself. Isn't this a subject then that should always reign supreme in the believer's heart? Christ is the noble theme that claims the Christian's heart and mind. Daily praise should be boiling over in your soul and find expression upon your lips, your tongue, the pen of a ready writer, unable to be repressed. Speech that cannot be held back because Jesus 
is the noble theme of your thoughts. And though Christ has been crucified upon Calvary's cross, it's not as though we can't hear his gracious speech any longer. For while our kingly prophet was indeed crucified on that cruel tree, he was raised from the dead, ascended to heaven, and is exalted at the right hand of the Father, where he continues to exercise his prophetic voice. Thank God for that great truth. You remember those times in the history of Israel when there was a famine in the word of God. You remember the way, for example, Samuel speaks about a time when God was no longer revealing himself through his prophets. You remember a time in the prophets themselves when they spoke about a time of famine and prophecies. God was no longer speaking to his people through his word. But you see, that's not the case. In our day and time. Because the word of Christ. Continues. To be proclaimed. In the preaching. Of his word. Christ makes his gracious speech known. Through the preaching of the word. Our kingly prophet. Lord's day in and Lord's day out. Continues to exercise his prophetic voice among us. Building us up. In the holy faith. Have you heard this prophetic voice? And have you been saved by it? Have you called upon the name of this kingly prophet and priestly king? To be saved by him utterly. And enabled to continue to hear his gracious voice as he speaks to you every Lord's Day in the preaching of his word. Are you clamoring to hear that voice? Is there anywhere else today? Does the Bible tell us that we hear the voice of Christ anywhere else? I submit to you that it does not except in preaching. When you wake up Sunday morning, when you wake up on the Sabbath day, are you prepared? Is your heart so stirred up by the noble theme of Jesus Christ that you come into worship with bated breath, hanging on the word, As Christ speaks in its preaching. I fear, dear Christians, we do not. When I am there instead of here, I confess that I don't clamor, that I don't desire the word of Christ as I ought when I sit under its preaching. But we ought to. May God help us and give us a sense of what of the of the divine transaction that actually takes place when the one who's been ordained steps in the pulpit and speaks not that he's anything in himself but that he himself becomes Christ's mouthpiece to the congregation may he awake us from our sleepiness and our dullness of mind and enable us to transcend the ordinary, to peak our heads above the clouds of heaven itself and to see our glorious and gracious Savior in the preaching of his word. Let's pray together. Lord, as we have considered this great theme of our kingly prophet Jesus, we bring a thanksgiving to you and we bring a confession to you. We thank you, O Lord, that you have ordained 
Christ's voice should still be heard in preaching. We thank you for the great fulfillment of these prophetic words in the text of our song. When Jesus came as a baby who was a king in the cradle, you have fulfilled all of the types and the shadows of Old Testament scripture in him. And that you have determined that his voice should still ring out among the congregation. That we might hear this one upon whose lips grace has been poured. And through whose lips grace pours out. The one you have blessed forever. This great king whose throne is forever and ever. Whose scepter is a scepter of uprightness. Forgive us, O oh God, when we have not longed for your word. When we have not come prepared to hear the voice of Christ as he speaks to his people. And work, O oh Lord, through your gracious word. Through the word of Christ itself, work in us a greater desire to commune with Christ. And especially to commune with him. In his gracious word, we ask in Jesus' name, amen.